Well, welcome to our first Tuerman in-person lecture uh, since spring of 2020. It's great to see so many folks here. Uh, welcome to the East Campus Union redesigned. For those of you who uh, haven't been here um, since the renovation, uh, welcome to the, the renovated Great Plains Room. It's a fantastic space. Uh, we essentially have one third more of the space um, than we had previously. Uh, if uh, those of you who are graduates of Kasner, we were uh, out of space for the Kasner salute and actually had to go to the Devaney Center, which isn't a bad thing, but getting the Kasner salute back onto East Campus, there's the microphone is much better. <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is Mike Bame and I have the amazing privilege of serving as the Institute for uh, Ag and Natural Resources Vice Chancellor and then also as the Vice President for Agriculture and Natural Resources at the University of Nebraska. And this is a special uh, opportunity. I didn't see uh, Keith Heuerman, um slip in. Um, Keith is uh, only missed one Hewerman lecture in the 10 years that this has been going on. Uh, for those of you who know who, who Keith and Norma Hewerman are, um, near, they live uh, near Phillips, Nebraska. They're amazingly generous. What a great story um, that he has. Two of my favorite uh, times since being in Nebraska, now my fifth season, my fifth harvest, sitting in, with Keith usually with Josh Egley uh, at the table, having coffee with Keith and just having a chance to talk about what's important in agriculture. And this gift that their family has made allows us to bring speakers to Nebraska that we might not normally uh, get. And so today's uh, keynote speaker, uh, Frank Mitloner, and our amazing panel and our amazing moderator, Barb Cooksley, is uh, no exception to that rule. So a little bit about um, house rules. Uh, we are pretty well packed. I think Jesse Brophy is going to try to get some uh, more chairs. We're, for those who are listening via the live stream, it's standing room only in the newly renovated East Campus Union Great Plains room. Uh, we will go ahead and uh, kick things off. Um, if you have questions and you're online, or I suppose if you're in the audience and you don't want to raise your hand, uh, you can go ahead and fill out a question on our live web form, or you can uh, use hashtag HL series, um, pound signed HL series, and tweet your question. Jesse's staffing that uh, hashtag, and, and we'll get your questions answered. So the lineup, uh, I will uh, pass the mic off to uh, Dr. Clint Crable. Clint is uh, no stranger. He started the same day I did back in January of 17 as our department head for the Department of Animal Science. Clint will introduce the speakers, in particular uh, the leadoff speaker, um, Dr. Mitloner, who will uh, have about 15 to 20 minutes of thought-provoking uh, presentation, and then the panelists will join Frank on the stage, and Barb will have a facilitated dialogue. We'll do that for a bit, and then we'll open it up to questions. Jessie Brophy will have the mic, and she'll be uh, up and down the center aisle, so if you have a question, just raise your hand, jump up and down, uh, scream out, and she'll bring you the microphone, and we'll have some Q&A, and then we'll wrap things up. Um, uh, on time. So without further ado, Dr. Clint Crable. Well, good afternoon. This is absolutely tremendous. Thank you all so much for attending this lectureship. We are blessed with the great leadership and INR. Really appreciate Dr. Bame. Mike empowered Greg Ibaugh. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring Greg uh, into the fold here a little bit, throw him under the bus. Uh, but he and I uh, had the opportunity to really think about what this Sherman Lecture might look like and invite just an amazing panel and keynote speaker that are gonna share information today that I know that will be uh, 
uh, instrumental to your operations and is very important to you and the work that you do. Very briefly, because the expertise is seated here at the table and I don't want to take a lot of their time, I'm going to introduce them and I'll stick to the script here. Uh, just ask them to stand up. Barb Cooksley is serving as the moderator for today's session. Ranch is with her husband, George, near Anselmo, Nebraska, Custer County. She has been heavily engaged in INR and the University of Nebraska, has served on several committees, and is also no stranger to Nebraska cattlemen, served as the first female president for Nebraska cattlemen in 2016. Also serves on committee at the national level at NCBA, served uh, for Tom Osborne and for Congressman Adrian Smith, so also no stranger to politics. Uh, Barb, we're very grateful for you taking the time out of a busy schedule to serve as moderator today. Many of you also know Colin Woodall, uh, Chief Executive Officer of NCBA, leading the country's oldest and largest national association for cattle producers. He's a Texan, but we accepted him into the state of Nebraska today. He's from from uh, uh, bring Big Springs and, and you know maybe even the lower point is that he's a Texas A&M grad. I'm just kidding, but uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, Colin is is passionate uh, about all things beef cattle and also all things youth. And I, Colin, I really appreciate your involvement with the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo, other scholarship opportunities for students. So not only do you serve our industry, but you serve your community. Uh, the other thing I noted about Colin last night is that uh, he cleans his plate uh, and, and so and, and actually made that point. And so uh, I think people that stay at the table until their, their uh, uh, plate is clean tend to finish projects that they start. And that was all good until he didn't finish his chicken today, but we, uh, we went ahead and forgave him for that. <laughs> Colin, thank you, thank you very much for being here. Uh, Larry Quint is a research fellow at ConAgra Foods, leads ConAgra Brand Strategic Research Group, responsible for meat product and meat component development across the total enterprise. Uh, Larry has been a strong supporter also of the meat industry, has served several roles for the American Meat Science Association for the last 35 years, Research Conference Chairman, uh, NCBA Research Advisory Board, Reciprocal Meets Conference Host uh, Committee Chair, and most important to me, as he serves on my External Advisory Committee for the Department of Animal Science. Larry, thank you very much for your engagement here as well. Dr. Erickson, uh, again, needs uh, likely not much introduction to this group. He's a Nebraska Cattle Industry Chair and Professor in the Department of Animal Science. Been on the faculty since 2001 and serves as a Nebraska Beef Feedlot Extension Specialist. Galen's a rare individual that gets to have a three-way split to his appointment, so he's important to all three mission areas, research extension and teaching, mostly focused on feed yard nutrition and management, has taken on a lot of leadership roles recently as well. Galen has trained at around 100, I didn't count them up exactly, but around 100 graduate students has published 150 manuscripts that are peer-reviewed and has attracted about $10 million in extramural funding and tells me he's just getting started. So uh, uh, really, really blessed to have Galen in the Department of Animal Science. The keynote speaker, and Frank, I may just have you make your way up or to the stage if you'd like. Really uh, an honor and a privilege to introduce to you Dr. Frank Mitloner. Professor and Air Quality Specialist in Cooperative Extension in the Department of Animal Science at UC Davis. Frank received his Master's of Science in Animal Science and Engineering uh, from the University of Leipzig, Germany, and a doctorate degree in Animal Science from Texas Tech. Uh, did a couple of year postdoc there uh, with Mike Gallion prior to joining UC Davis in 2002. Dr. Mitloner is known for his research, uh, both, both domestically and abroad, has trained numerous students, interacts with scientists, farmers, ranchers, policymakers, public at large. I hope most, if not all of you, follow him uh, as the greenhouse gas or GHG guru on Twitter. If you don't, you will after today. He also established a center uh, at UC Davis 
that brings clarity to the intersection of animal agriculture and the environment to help our global community understand the environment and human health impacts of livestock. Frank has won numerous awards in all mission areas, again, research, teaching, and extension. Uh, most recently, the Cass Borlaug Communication Award in 2019, a very prestigious award. In 2006, many of you recall that a publication came out that was called Livestock's Long Shadow. Frank looked at the data in Livestock's Long Shadow and said something's not right with this calculation. And so he went to work and he and uh, his colleagues and students published that rebuttal in 2009 uh, called Clearing the Air, Livestock's uh, Contribution to Climate Change. And that really provided, in my opinion, Frank, a springboard and a platform uh, where he has been the voice for animal agriculture. And Frank, I told you last night, and I honestly believe it, that had it not been for you and the steps that you've taken, being out front at the, at the front line or on the front line, we'd be way behind this narrative. So thank you so much for being here. Please help me welcome our panelists and Dr. Frank Mitlone. Okay, now I should be on. Am I on? Yeah. Well, I am honored and I'm so delighted to be here um, and having such a wonderful crowd. In fact, I almost didn't make it. I'm serious. Yesterday I flew from Sacramento to Minneapolis and I was so pleased that it worked out because there was a strong rainfall yesterday in California. I made it to Minneapolis to be then told your flight to Lincoln is canceled. It's like, holy smoke, what do I do now? I made it onto another flight to Omaha. And right next to me on that flight sat a young gentleman. And I shared with him that I have no idea how to get to Lincoln. And he said, don't worry, I'll drive you. I said, do you live in Lincoln? He said, no, I don't. But I'll drive you. The gentleman is John Sheffer. Raise your hand right over there. That is what we need to get more of in this country. That is what we need to get more of in this country. And I'm told that here in Nebraska you find these kind of people. I'm still looking for them in California so far, I haven't found them. <laughs> <laughs> so I was asked to uh, talk to you about livestock's impact on climate. And that obviously is a very hot topic. A very hot topic that you read about frequently, most recently uh, here in Omaha. Uh, raise your hand. The author right here on the first, uh, first, first row, um, you know, trying to get some clarity into this fear because there is so much controversy right now and people are yelling at each other rather than listening to arguments and, and really uh, having a, a thoughtful discussion. So that's a problem. Uh, I thought this was a publication here, uh, a report that helped clarify some of this. So I was asked to give you a 25-minute short wrap-up of what I do there and why things are uh, quite different today with respect to our view on livestock and climate than it was some time ago. So I'm on Twitter. I was already introduced as, uh, as having the handle GHG Guru. Uh, just really quickly, disclosures. Some people want to know where I get funding from. Most of my funding is from state agencies or federal agencies, uh, but I'm also the director of the CLEAR Center. The CLEAR Center also gets support by industry, by NGOs, by agencies, and so on. So, cutting right through the chase. What are greenhouse gases and how do they warm our planet? What you see on this slide here is the sun radiating solar beams to the surface of the Earth. Normally, that radiation and the heat contained therein would be reflected back into space if there weren't these so-called greenhouse gases. Gases such as CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, they trap the heat from the sun. Similar to a styrofoam cup versus a china cup versus a Starbucks $20 insulated cup. All three 
can receive coffee and keep it warm, but we all know the China cup keeps the coffee warmer than the Styrofoam cup, and the Starbucks $20 insulated cup definitely longer than the others, right? Similar to these three coffee cups, these gas molecules here have a different ability to trap heat from the sun. And that is referred to as the so-called global warming potential. GWP100 it's called. That is the unit used to describe how effective a gas traps heat from the sun. This unit is now 30 years old and in my opinion significantly flawed significantly flawed, and I'm very pleased to announce that not only does Frank Midlerner think it's significantly flawed, but a growing number of climatologists agrees on that. Particularly significantly flawed when you have constant sources of that gas, such as a constant cattle herd. More about this in a second. When you just look at this slide, it looks like methane is simply a more powerful CO2. It's pretty much the same, it's just more powerful just like tequila is more powerful than beer. <laughs> but that's not true. There are other differences, and you will see in a minute what these are. So remember, global warming potential, GWP100, has been the unit to describe the impact of uh, gases such as methane and nitrous oxide in comparison to CO2, saying methane is 28 times more potent than CO2, hence we need to get rid of methane-producing sources. That's the narrative that you see out there. Now, this is a very important slide. It's a little convoluted, but it shows that methane has a budget. There is a budget for methane consisting of sources on the one side, such as fossil fuel production, agricultural waste, biomass burning wetlands, and so on. And all these sources combined emit a total of 558 terograms globally. That's how much methane is produced by all the different sources in the world, around 560. What most people who report on methane do not mention is that methane is not just produced, but methane is also destroyed. And that brings us to the right side of this budget, the total sinks amounting to 548, let's call it 550. In other words, there are 560 terograms produced globally, and there are 550 terograms destroyed globally every year. And if you want to know what's the net, then you need to subtract the one from the other, and that leads us to this number, 10, which is still a number we seek to further reduce, but definitely a number very different from just looking at the sources. Take our message here, methane is not just produced, methane is also destroyed. And that destruction is referred to as atmospheric removal of this gas. Everybody with me? If you look at this, slide, at this uh, on the right side here, if you look at this right side, you see that under total sinks, there's a large arrow pointing downward. And underneath it says, sink from chemical reactions in the atmosphere. This chemical reaction is this atmospheric removal I'm talking about. It is a process by which methane, let's say this fist were a methane molecule, meets another molecule called a radical a hydroxyl radical. This methane molecule meets a radical, and the radical destroys the methane. And that, on average, happens within a decade. So methane has a short lifespan because there's something in the air that destroys it. And this process, the destruction of methane, is currently not considered in public policy, in regulations, and so forth. The world thinks that methane is just like CO2 or nitrous oxide, a gas that's produced, but that's the end of the story. And it's not the end of the story, as you will see in the next few slides. The, short, the destruction of methane leads to this slide, which is the very short lifespan. While CO2 has a lifespan of 1,000 years, once you burn fossil fuel, that CO2 is in the air for 1,000 years, similarly to nitrous oxide, which is in the air for over 100 years, but methane is not. Methane is in the air for a little over a decade, and then it's gone, okay? So that's obviously a big difference across these gases, a difference that's currently not accounted for using GWP100. 
not accounted for in the way we currently quantify the impact of methane on climate. This is like you go to your bank and saying to your banker, from now on, I will only talk about my income and not my expenses. That would be a great budget, right? <laughs> I will now explain to you how carbon, how methane, which is CH4, how methane gets that carbon that's contained therein, okay? It all starts with photosynthesis, and what I'm describing to you now is the so-called biogenic carbon cycle. Photosynthesis is the process, you've all learned that earlier in life, where plants take on sunlight, water, and a source of carbon. The source of carbon they, they get is from the atmosphere, atmospheric CO2. That's where the carbon in plants comes from. They suck it out of the air and convert it into carbohydrates, such as cellulose, the world's most abundant biomass, or starch. A bovine comes along and eats that carbohydrate in the plants, and some of that above ground material will then make its way into methane, CH4. But is the carbon in that CH4, is the carbon in this methane new and additional carbon added to the atmosphere? And the answer is no, it's not. It's recycled carbon, which used to be CO2 before. Now it is in the form of methane, CH4, and it takes approximately a decade when these radicals conduct this hydroxyl oxidation process which kills methane and makes it into CO2 again, okay? So the carbon in the methane used to be CO2 and it will become CO2 again. But while this methane is in the air, it indeed is a potent greenhouse gas. I call it the fast and furious. Furious because it has good punch to it, but fast because it's short-lived. Do not take what I'm saying now as saying methane doesn't matter. Methane does matter. Methane is a potent greenhouse gas. Methane is a greenhouse gas we seek to further reduce. But methane is a different, very different kind of gas compared to other greenhouse gases, and that's a fact that we currently neglect. And that's a fact that puts a huge black eye onto your industry's uh, face. So carbon goes from the atmosphere into plants, then into methane, and then back into CO2. And that is a complete cycle. That happens in approximately a decade. Is this similar or dissimilar to other sources and other sources of greenhouse gases? The number one being fossil fuels, which are oil, coal, and gas, which are by far the number one source of greenhouse gases. Let's see how they are similar or dissimilar to what I just described to you in the biogenic carbon cycle. Fossil fuels are oil, coal, and gas, and they used to be forests, other plants, animals such as dinosaurs. They died, decayed, fossilized a long, long time ago, and they accumulated underground until 70 years ago, humans started to extracting that from the ground. We pulled all of that carbon from the ground, and what did we do with it? We burned it. So where's that carbon now? It's in the atmosphere. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the reason why, why CO2 concentrations in the air go up, 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 and up. They never come down because this gas has a lifespan of a thousand years. This is not a short-lived cycle like it is on the livestock side. This is a one-way street from the bottom up into the atmosphere. People comparing cows versus cars are misleading the public in a major way. I don't know if they are uh, doing this on purpose or accidentally, but it's happening, and the public is starting to believe this stuff, that cows are a major source of, uh, of our climate picture. They do play a role. In the United States, livestock emits approximately 4% of all greenhouse gases. That's according to the EPA, 4%. Fossil fuel sectors are 80%, 80. Okay? So the livestock sector has a contribution, but let's make sure that we are not overblowing that contribution. We need to acknowledge what the contribution is, set goals, and say, in the future we want to reach further reductions, and here's how we want to do that. But let's not bark up the wrong tree with respect to major emitters in the country or throughout the world. This slide here contrasts these two sectors, the fossil fuel sector on the one side, where fossil ancient carbon was stored in the ground, we extracted it, we burn it, and when we do so, then we're adding new and additional carbon to the atmosphere. 
On the livestock side, you have atmospheric CO2 that's pulled into plants. I just described that during photosynthesis. Some of that carbon goes into above ground vegetation. Majority goes into the below ground vegetation, into the roots. And from the roots, soil microbes take that carbon that was in the air and they sequester it in the soil. Soil carbon sequestration is the name of it. And that is believed to be a way of trapping approximately one-third of all carbon emitted by human activity. Our soils are critically important in trapping carbon from the atmosphere and locking it away. Again, it's called soil carbon sequestration. How significant this process is, is a a very volatile discussion right now. There are people who say this is extremely important and there are people who say it's not important at all. I think you here in, in, at the University of Nebraska have several scientists who are working on this as we speak to make sure that we get this quantification done right. It's of critical importance for the livestock sector. So a cow comes along, eats some above ground vegetation, belches some methane out, some methane comes out the back end as manure, but within a decade it's gone, it's CO2 again. Very different, one-way street here and a short-lived cycle here. I think it makes sense as to how and why these two should not be compared. So now colleagues from the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom looked into particularly methane and said, it's incorrect that we are not accounting for the atmospheric removal of methane. Methane is not just produced, methane is also destroyed and that needs to be accounted for. And so they looked into GWP100, this old unit, and they said that if you have a constant source of methane, let's say a constant cattle herd, and you use this old unit to quantify the impacts of that constant herd, then this old unit, GWP100, overblows the impact by a factor of three to four. That's what the colleagues from Oxford said. I agreed with that. I oftentimes gave talks citing that, and some people believed me, some people didn't believe me. Because at the end of the day, I'm an Aggie too, right? How can you believe in Aggie, right? Well, you can believe this Aggie, I can tell you that much. Because I have studied this in and out, and I can tell you these colleagues from Oxford were right. This old unit only looked at the production of methane, not the destruction. So what they said was this, that GWP100 overestimates the impact of methane on warming if you have a constant source by a factor of four. This statement was just quoted by the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, IPCC, in their most recent report three weeks ago. And that report said the same thing, that constant sources characterized by the old matrix will be exaggerated by a factor of three to four. And that applies to you if you are a cattle producer. They produced, these colleagues from Oxford, a new unit called GWP star. And this new unit, GWP star, accounts for both production and destruction of methane. And it describes the actual warming impact of this gas. That's why I'm such a fan of this new matrix. By the way, this new matrix, GWP star, was also quoted extensively in the most recent IPCC report. This is not just something you hear from me. This is now in the world's most authoritative publication of its kind uh, that was published a couple weeks ago. And here is a screenshot of that publication, and I'll quote, expressing methane emissions as CO2 equivalent emissions using GWP100 overestimates the effect of constant methane emissions on global temperatures by a factor of three to four. All right, so it's a big deal how you quantify emissions. It has been done significantly wrong. It needs to be changed. Not to whitewash or greenwash or creatively account, but to scientifically accurately account for the impact of a sector such as the livestock sector on warming. Because only if we do the math right, we can arrive at effective mitigation, only then. So I will now explain to you in a couple slides the difference between CO2 and methane. Imagine you drive from home to work on Monday. And when you do so, you burn gas. And when you do that, then you put CO2 into the atmosphere. On, on Tuesday, you drive again, and you add new and additional CO2 to the atmosphere. 
which is now on top of what you put out on Monday. On Wednesday, you drive again, and new additional CO2 is put into the atmosphere on top of Tuesdays and Mondays. In other words, every time you burn fossil fuel, you're adding new and additional CO2 to the atmosphere. And that causes new and additional warming to our planet. Why do I stress that so much, new and additional? Because the Paris Climate Accord that we have just become signatories of uh, says very clearly that the goal of humanity is to reduce further warming to less than one and a half to two degrees centigrade. That is the global goal, and we are part of trying to achieve that goal. So, when, it, when you burn fossil fuel, you always put new and additional carbon into the atmosphere. But let's look at, at our methane. When you have, uh, let's say, a cattle herd of 100 animals, and you've had that for decades, then only when you started that operation, you added new and additional methane, and hence new and additional warming uh, to the atmosphere. After the first decade, the amount of methane produced and the amount of methane destroyed were in balance. A constant cattle herd does not add new and additional warming to our planet. And that's good news. I will give you a short analogy. Imagine two bathtubs. One will be the analogy for CO2. The other one will be the analogy for methane. <clears throat> If you imagine the bathtub for CO2 being one where you have a faucet but no drain, a faucet but no drain, every time you turn on that faucet, you add water to the, to the, the bathtub and the water levels will rise. They can only rise, they can never go down because there's no drain. The other analogy, the one for methane, is one where you have a bathtub that has both a faucet and a drain and the drain is always open. The drain, of course, now stands for the atmospheric removal process of methane. If you turn on that faucet on normal, then the same amount of water that it goes into your bathtub is going out through the drain. And that means your water levels will be stable. If you turn down the faucet, on, so have it on low, then, because the, the drain is still open, water levels will go down. And that's the case. If we reduce methane, we reduce warming. The old unit does not account for that, GWP 100. The new unit, GWP star, does account for that. But if you turn that faucet on, on all the way, then you might actually overwhelm the drain. And then the water might still rise. The water level might still rise. And that is what happens in part of the developing world where an increasing demand for animal source foods is satisfied by people growing the size of their herds. And that increases methane. It's not happening in the developed world, it is happening in parts of the developing world. This is not a finger pointing exercise, by the way. That's real, that's just happening. So two, three scenarios. I want to explain and contrast this old unit GWP 100 versus the new unit GWP star using three scenarios. The first one is one where methane over 30 years increases by a sector. The second one is one where methane is stable or slightly decreasing. And the third one is one where methane decreases by a lot, let's say 35%. How would these three scenarios, the increasing, the stable, and the decreasing methane scenario, be depicted using this old unit GWP 100? GWP 100 would, would describe all three scenarios as a strong increase of greenhouse gas emissions, leading to a strong amount of additional warming. And we know that's wrong, at least for the stable and the decreasing scenario, because it does not account for atmospheric removal. If you use this new unit from Oxford, then it only agrees with the old unit that when you increase methane sharply, you are adding a lot of additional warming. We do not want to do that, and it is happening in part of the developing world, as I just said. But if you slightly reduce methane, if you hold it stable or slightly reduce methane, you're not adding additional warming, which is shown here by not any blue north of the x-axis. In fact, because there's a slight decrease here, there's some blue south of the x-axis and a negative number in front of the, a negative sign in front of the number, and that means there will be some negative warming negative warming, i.e. cooling. If you reduce methane by a lot, let's say 35%, then you're pulling a lot of carbon from the air. Similar to planting trees, forests. 
you are now pulling carbon from the air, which leads to, which leads to significant reductions of warming. And that means cooling. Meaning, if we manage in animal agriculture to significantly reduce methane, and that is my goal, significantly reduce methane, then we will have a positive impact on our climate. Namely, we are pulling carbon out of the air, which has a cooling effect. I don't want you to go, go home and say, Frank said that cows uh, are cooling the planet, okay? That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is, if we reduce methane, then we reduce warming, okay? And that can be done. In the state of California, we have a new law which mandates a 40% reduction of methane, 4-0, to be achieved in the next 10 years. And I will show you uh, what happened. Instead of using the cane approach of using rules and regulations and fines to make farmers reduce methane, the California legislature did something very smart for a change. <laughs> they used the carrot approach, which is financially incentivizing the reduction of methane through capital investments. The state took half a billion dollars by the hand and partnered with the dairy industry to put in techniques and technologies to reduce methane. One of these technologies is the use of covered lagoons. You see here a dairy. We have 1,300 uh, dairies in the state. A uh, very significant uh, proportion of U.S. dairy comes from California. And what used to be an open lagoon, this one here, what used to be an open lagoon is now covered. Hence the name covered lagoon or covered lagoon digester. And what you see bulging out here is the biogas that's generated underneath, 60% of which is methane gas. But it's trapped now. It cannot go into the air. And now comes the deal. They're taking the biogas from these covered lagoons, and they're converting the biogas into a fuel type called renewable natural gas, RNG. This conversion from dairy biogas to renewable natural gas fuel is considered the most carbon negative fuel type there is. That means we are pulling carbon out of the air. That fuel goes into semi-trucks and replaces diesel that used to be used by those trucks. And now they are run on, on RNG. If you convert biogas to RNG, you get paid the so-called low carbon fuel standard credits, which run very high, $200 per ton of CO2E, which might not mean much to you, but what will mean a lot is that there are dairymen telling me I make more money from my carbon credits today than from my milk check. So this whole issue of methane mitigation can really become even financially interesting to producers. We have now taken steps to be aggressive about methane mitigation. Our dairy industry alone over the last three years has reduced methane by 25%. That amounts to 2.2 million metric tons, and that's what it is. 25%, the overall state goal is 40%. Our dairy sector is already over halfway there. Meaning, our dairy sector has done this. Reduced methane by a lot, affecting this cooling. And this, this cooling of the on the methane side offsets other greenhouse gases also produced on dairies, leading this industry to a point of climate neutrality. Climate neutrality means this sector will not in any way affect the climate negatively in the next years to come. And we will get there. And we will get there relatively quickly. And I think not just the dairy industry can do it, the beef industry can do it, and everybody in animal agriculture can. What I'm telling you is I believe that there is way more of an opportunity in this picture than there is a challenge. We can absolutely do that, reduce greenhouse gases, particularly methane, and, and then harness that effect and make this uh, general principle into a significant uh, a solution to a societal problem. If you want to know more about this, you want to have a recap of what I just said, uh, there's a little... YouTube video called Rethinking Methane that my center put onto the web on YouTube. And we also wrote a white paper called Pathway to Climate Neutrality for US Beef and Dairy. Um, I think that within the next few decades, both our beef and dairy industry can be climate neutral. And I cannot tell you how happy I was when I heard that NCBA announced such ambitious goals as, as what they did. And, uh, and I feel that the rest of the industry will go the same way. So with that, 
Um, I will not go through all of that. I will just tell you we have seen incredible uh, advances on the, beef, on the dairy side. Uh, one last slide. Oh, I have two more slides. This one here is one uh, that I think is kind of important. People ask me, in addition to what we do in agriculture in reducing greenhouse gases, how about changing our diet? Wouldn't that have a major impact on methane? Going meatless Monday or becoming vegans? So colleagues of mine looked into this. They looked at what, does it, what, would, it, what would it bring if an omnivore were to go vegan for one year? How much greenhouse gases would be reduced? They found that going vegan for one year would reduce your carbon footprint by 0.8 tons. Now you'll ask, is that a lot or not? Contrast that with one single flight of one passenger from the United States to Europe, which generates 1.6 tons of greenhouse gases. So I would have to go vegan for two years to offset a trip I did last week to the Netherlands. Per passenger, okay? So what if the entire nation were to go meatless Monday? That's oftentimes tooted as, you know, we could make a huge difference in our carbon footprint. That would lead to a 0.3% reduction of greenhouse gases in the United States, and the entire country going vegan as an extreme e example, um, just to show what, what, what that would be, that would amount to 2.6% of total reductions of greenhouse gases. So the answer to the question, can we eat our way out of climate change, is very clear, no we can't. Does our food have any impact on climate? Yes, it does. But we can further reduce that, and we can make the agricultural sector part of a solution. My last slide is one that I particularly like, this one. It shows an average US family in front of all the food that's wasted every year. 40%, 40 of all the food produced in this country, 40% of all the food produced in the entire developed world, and even 40% of the food produced in developing countries globally is wasted. In the developed world, at the consumer level, that's us at home and in restaurants, in the developing world, more at the producer level, because people can't harvest on time, transport their goods to the markets, and so on. 40% is a global number, one that I think everybody here will agree we need to drastically reduce. We have that responsibility, and yes, we can absolutely get there. So with that, I just want to tell you, I do write a blog. There's the address, uh, and the center that I'm directing is clear.ucdavis.edu. There's a lot of stuff on there with respect to explainers and videos, uh, webinars, uh, Twitter, and so on. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to uh, joining this illustrious panel. Thank you very much. Now it's on. Good afternoon and thank you. Uh, it is with great pleasure that I sit up here with these mm -hmm. uh, four professionals mm -hmm. this afternoon. Your mic is not on. It's not on? it's not on? It's green. Can you hear it? It says it's green. Uh, put it a little higher. Now, can you hear me yet? All right, thank you. start over that it's a pleasure to be here with these four professionals. We're going to have a discussion today about cattle production and climate. I am a cow-calf producer. I do not have all the answers. I depend on every segment uh, that's out here from our research or extension. We need companies of ConAgra 
who have to deal with sustainability. They're looking to us to be sustainable. And what I've found in the short time that I've been with these gentlemen over the last day and a half, they are passionate, they're dedicated, and I sense a very real personal sense of responsibility to our industry. So what we can take away from this today, I think will differ for each individual, but be assured there are people uh, just as passionate as we are out there on the ground growing those cattle to help make our industry better. We're gonna stay with our theme, which is the myth-busting cattle and climate but we're going to focus on Nebraska livestock's environmental footprint. And I wanted to start with uh, American consumers. And I'm going to define consumers as anyone who eats. So everyone here, we're all consumers. American consumers hear about environmental impact of livestock production, and particularly beef. And so I'm going to ask each gentleman, um, how do we inform our consumers regarding sustainability? And then our next question that would follow up with that, I want you to identify what are we doing well in the industry and what can we do better? So we'll start with um, how do we inform our consumers regarding sustainability so they understand? And go ahead, Dr. Mitloner. <clears throat> Well, that's a good question. It's a million dollar question. How do we inform consumers? The problem is, one of the major challenges is that we live in a world where everybody thinks they are food experts. And the sad truth is, they're not. Okay? And I don't mean to sound arrogant here, but people know so little about food, how food is grown, uh, you know, about all externalities around food and so on. Um, and our, our school system is kind of failing us uh, because they're not learning it in school. Uh, so how do, we, how do we reach them? Well, I have made the personal decision to, in addition to training students and doing research and so on, uh, become uh, an effective science communicator. And using social media along with uh, work with the media, with the mainstream media and so on, uh, to get the word out. I am not shy on, on dealing with any outlet, whether that's you know, Time Magazine or CNN or whether that's uh, you know, Fox or anybody else, newspapers, uh, we, have to, we have to work with all of them. Sometimes that can be very frustrating because sometimes I, I fear that, or I feel that people go into an interview already know exactly what they want to write and they will just grab one or two sentences of what I say and then, and then say they interviewed me. But that's not really substantive. So, um, anyhow, so there are many different ways but uh, I think, for me personally, the best way of reaching the public is through social media. Mr. Quint, how would your company address so, that? Uh, at Canagra Brands, uh, we recognize the United Nations FAO definition of sustainable diets. So it's kind of aligning with things that have already been expressed out there. <clears throat> and they define the sustainable diets as those that are low uh, environmental impact. Um, which contribute to the food and nutrition security um, and healthy life for the present and future generations. So uh, what, what we're looking forward to is the day that we can talk about beef in the light of its low environmental impact. There's the opportunity that we will get there. Um, we've got uh, a great responsibility to our consumers because they want nutrition Beef is very nutritious. Um, it's important in the diet. Um, we just have to find that way, that science uh, that seems to be pursued, and we will get there to be able to tell them very factually that beef is going to be something that can be part of that, that diet now and in the future and not compromise uh, you know, the, the planet in, uh, for generations to come. Thank you. Mr. Woodall. We just have to laugh at that because I've known Barb for a long time and Mr. Woodall never comes out of her. I work for her, by the way. So <laughs> regardless, I, I think as a cattle industry, we've learned with all of our experience over the decades that we better listen to the consumer. And that's one of the reasons why we're having this conversation today is because consumers made it very clear 
that the issue of sustainability is top of mind. And as we have gone through the COVID pandemic and people have had more time on their hands to wonder where their food comes from, I think that has just elevated that. But it's more than just thinking that we understand what the consumer believes. We need to ask what the consumer believes sustainability is about. And so that's one of the things that NCBA has actually done. We've gone out with our market research team and we've asked the question to consumers, what does sustainability mean to you? And it might come as a surprise that the biggest answer is animal welfare, not the environmental impact. The environmental impact is still extremely important. I think what you're gonna find out throughout the panel is as we talk about sustainability, it's gonna hit a lot of components, but one of those is animal welfare. And so we've been able to use that information to then tailor messaging back out to the consumer via social media, via traditional media, and also getting back on broadcast television in some areas using the checkoff supported beef, it's what's for dinner brand. And CBA is a contractor to the national beef checkoff. And we utilize those checkoff dollars with the beef, it's what's for dinner campaign to get out there and talk about sustainability. As a matter of fact, right now, we have sustainability ads going on in social media. We have them on Sirius XM radio. We have them on uh, several of the sports stations and we are doing tailgate, college football tailgates throughout the country right now, talking about sustainability. But a key that we have to keep in mind is the consumer also very clearly told us that, all right, they believe that the, uh, a topic of sustainability should be focused around animal welfare is one component and they're interested in hearing our story but they don't want us to tell the story and then give them a recipe I said keep them separate tell us the story what's going on and then come in through another angle or through another uh, outlet and show us what the hot recipe is don't combine the two another interesting component that we've had to factor in to our outreach to the consumers. And again, looking at consumers of, of all ages, not just millennials, not just the newest generation that is focused on social media, but even getting in back to traditional media outlets so that way we're hitting all consumers. Dr. Erickson? Well, um, first of all, I think that if, if consumers, uh, I, I don't disagree with what uh, Colin said, but if consumers are going to focus on making choices on food relative to climate impact, then I guess my number one concern is to make sure we have excellent science and data collected on what is that impact on uh, of food production relative to climate. And, uh, University of Nebraska is engaged in that. There's a team of us all engaged on this issue. And so I think automatically about consumers and, and diet choice and making decisions on, on climate, what is the impact of beef production on the climate? And I think some of the things you saw in Frank's presentation illustrates that you, some of those calculations are, are that histor historical calculations may not be accurate. So we're focused on uh, ways to mitigate enteric loss of methane from ruminants, which is a natural process, but can be manipulated, and there's a lot of work and interest in that. We're focused on what are the actual carbon emissions from beef production systems. Again, a team of, of folks like Andy Sucker and, and others and graduate students being trained to study CO2, methane, and N2O given off. Because I, I guess I'd hope that if consumers are really making a decision based on climate, that once we have actual information on totality of impact on, on climate, then that will inform their decision. My concern, which I'll raise maybe as more of a question, is in fact, are they making that decision or is that an excuse? There's other issues they have. Are some of those using perhaps some of those incorrect calculations have ulterior motives. That's a debate that I think people can have. My job, I believe, is to make sure we measure and accurately account for impact of beef production. And we've been doing that, not near long enough, not near as many sites as we need to do. But I think given a little time, we will answer that question for the state of Nebraska. And then hopefully consumers will make the right choice. <laughs>
and eat beef to improve the climate. Is that right? Yeah, there you go. There we go. Um, I, <clears throat> Dr. Quint, uh, what does your company, uh, how does it focus its uh, actions today in the sustainability and climate uh, and using uh, meat products? How do you focus your priorities? We have made a pledge uh, that using the year 2020 as a baseline that we're going to reduce our uh, greenhouse gas carbon footprint uh, by 20% on all the, all the beef uh, and other food materials that we source uh, by 2030. So uh, it's through the pledge and now the hard work of finding and aligning with those opportunities to live up to that pledge. Um, very encouraged by Galen's remarks and the science that's going on. Uh, the interesting thing is we made the pledge because it's what our consumers are asking for. It's what our investors are expecting. Um, and you don't necessarily know how you're going to get there when you make the pledge. You're making the pledge because it seems to be what is needed. Um, and now we're very uh, hopeful and encouraged by the work that will happen um, that shows that uh, not only can we meet that goal, but probably go beyond. Because mm -hmm. until the day comes that uh, uh, we're, you know, everybody understands that we're carbon neutral um, and that we're ac actually carbon neutral, I think it'll be one goal after another. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Woodall at NCBA, I understand as a trade organization, uh, they've developed goals. Um, can you tell us why and what those uh, goals are for the industry? Well, we're really excited about the goals that we have set. And the why is the simple fact that this issue is not going away. I think a lot of us, when we started talking about sustainability, felt that this was just going to be a fad topic of the decade, and then we wouldn't have to worry about it again. That is not the case because the international community is looking at this, the scientific community is looking at this, the consumers looking at this, the President of the United States is looking at this. So we felt that it was extremely important in order to be able to take the great information that Dr. Mittloner shared, be able to use that to illustrate quite clearly that when it comes to the issue of sustainability for us as producers, it's not about sitting back and waiting to be regulated more. We're up against regulation all the time. And the current administration and current Congress are more than willing to put even more rules and restrictions on us as cattle producers. We felt if we could take this and flip the narrative, say rather than make this about rules and regulations on us as producers, it was the time to tell our story, to tell our stewardship story because it's our stewardship story that has set up the ability to reach climate neutrality by 2040. Mm -hmm. And that is the first of our four goals, is to be climate neutral by 2040. And I will tell you that that has us a seat at the table in the White House and on Capitol Hill in a way that we've never seen before. Because we do have administration that has realized that if they are going to be successful in their climate goals, they understand that they have to have agriculture there at the table. Mm -hmm. And so we're able to take the issue of sustainability and our goals and weave them into every issue we're dealing with right now. Many of you have been following the discussions about the infrastructure bill and all of the proposals that are out there to potentially fund that, including taking away several of the tax provisions that allow us to stay in business as agriculturalists. We were able to take our sustainability talking points, weave that in to the specifics of these tax provisions and make it very clear to the President and to Congress that if you enact these tax increases on us, you make it harder for us to stay on the land, to pass these operations to the next generation. And ultimately, in a lot of cases, if they are sold, they are not going to be sold to another farmer or rancher. They can be sold to a developer. And I guarantee you, in order to reach the climate goals, you need green growing grass more than you need concrete. Green growing grass helps us get to these climate neutral goals. So that's where we started, was with climate neutrality. 
But as we've talked about, there's more to sustainability than just the environment and climate neutrality. We went further to say that back to the consumer data that I just shared with you and the consumer concerns about animal welfare that we need to ensure we are doing even more to educate producers and the consumers on programs such as beef quality assurance to again tell that stewardship story knowing that if we don't have healthy animals that we're taking care of we don't have an industry and the consumer needs to understand that we also need to make it very clear and the third goal is to look at how we take care of our workforce we're nothing without a workforce to help us whether those are farm and ranch hands whether they're pen riders in the feedlots or whether they are meat cutters on the line of the packing plant, we have to have those workers, or as we have seen through the pandemic, we as the producers then are saddled with the burden of trying to stay in business. And as a consumer, they also want to know that we actually care about everybody that's in the chain, because we all know that a lot of the workers, especially in the packing plants, are immigrant workers. And a lot of Americans want to know that we actually care for what these individuals are doing to help us succeed. And then finally, number four, it's about providing opportunities for you as cattle producers to be profitable. Because if you're not profitable, you can't keep these operations up and running, you can't keep the cattle on the land, then again, we can't use this superpower of being able to take the cycle that Dr. Mintloner showed, use our animals, to ultimately be a force for positive. And so we're proud of these goals. Uh, many of you in the audience were a part of it. Barb was a part of this. Now, this wasn't just done in a vacuum. It was made up of cattle producers, members of NCBA from across the country that got in and, and really debated this. And there were some hot debates before it was ultimately done. But we rolled it out and we got the attention of the media, we got the attention of the President of the United States, Congress, and hopefully many of you. So we're pretty proud of this. Now it's trying to do more to ultimately achieve all of those goals. Thank you. Dr. Erickson, as producers uh, and all across the, the food chain, especially in beef, we're looking to our university here in Nebraska to help us address and reach the numbers that Dr. Mitloner has shown us. What is the University of Nebraska doing uh, to help us down that path? Would you hand me those slides, the slide thing? Um, <clears throat> well, I think there's a, there's a few different things that we're currently working on. Um, and, and one of those areas is on enteric methane generation, okay? So similar to, to what Frank and University of California are doing, we're looking at feed additives, management, other ways to, to change or modify how much methane is naturally produced by cattle. Because as you saw, if we can cut that uh, and do something about that to lower that by 20%, 30%, I would point out it's going to be difficult to eliminate methane generation from cattle. It's a natural process. It serves a, a role in the rumen. And, uh, and by the way, those rumens are really what allow cattle to convert cellulose, the most common biomass on the face of the planet, into steaks with a little help from feedlots. You understand the point, though? So I think the methane generation, ways to mitigate it, understand what factors influence it, that's an area we're interested in. Um, we have uh, converted uh, some of our facilities. We call it the methane barn. That's very, uh, you know descriptive and uh, they're pen sized chambers and we can monitor methane really really well the second thing we're doing which i wanted to highlight or just show a graph um, and this is a team effort with a group from university of nebraska and, and ars scientists involved as well but using some sophisticated techniques andy's sitting here i i'm not the one responsible for how this works but it's very sophisticated and been used in lots of different ecosystems now imagine we're trying to use those same approaches with these cattle roaming around a pasture. And they're little, what we call point sources, right? They're eructating out methane. You gotta know where they're at constantly. So we've been monitoring that using eddy covariance methods, coming up with a flux tower. Here's the GPS data of some of those different pastures and cover crops. So we know where those cattle are 
theoretically all the time. This graph's probably the most important. So Barb, to answer your question, what are we doing? For the last four years, uh, through two programs, one called LTAR and one called FFAR, both federal and foundational grants, monitoring total systems emissions from cattle production systems common to eastern Nebraska. This graph uh, um, illustrates carbon accumulation in orange is in the wintertime and blue in the summertime, so there's carbon accumulating. That's with cattle not in the flux, flux area. Notice the, two, the three red arrows. We can take off what we monitored from that area in methane produced by the cattle, using the old incorrect number, CO2 that the cattle naturally respire, and quantified N2O. And it's still a positive balance. So I'm, I'm delighted, at least for this one site across the years that we've been monitoring so far, uh, carbon and climate issues are not a concern for that grazing system. Now, like I mentioned, I wish we had more years, more systems with more funding, and in the near future, we hope that will, that will happen. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mittler, we're getting close to the end of our, our hour, but uh, I've been told we can continue on, and we want to give the audience a chance to ask some questions, but I would like each of you to share a takeaway from this talk, this discussion today for our audience. And again, from the address, the producer, I guess, to the consumer, what, what is our takeaway from this talk today? So in my opinion, one of the most important aspects is that we need to accurately quantify the impacts of these food producing sectors, okay, using scientifically defensible methods. In the past, that wasn't the case. Now it is the case. I want to make very clear that everybody understands this is not some kind of creative accounting or using a method that shows lower impacts or so. In fact, when you use this GWP star number that I showed you and you increase methane, then this new unit is much worse than the old unit. Okay? This is not a greenwashing exercise. This is very scientific. And I tell you, I am very excited to see that the beef, that the dairy industry in this country are setting aggressive goals and they're thinking about milestones as to how the reaching of these goals can be quantified. And that is the way we get to that point, okay? So I have no doubt that some people out there will, will try changing the goalposts in the meantime. Uh, that has always happened. But, um, you know, sustainability is not a goal, it's a path we are walking on, okay? It's a path we're working on. You never really get there, but we make constant improvements. And so I think we are in a good way. Mr. Quinn? As ConAgra set our goals for reduction in greenhouse gases, we created uh, a chart that showed of all the food and packaging materials that we buy, the biggest challenge we had by far exponentially was beef. Uh, so it's kind of overwhelming. And then, you know, a lot of the time uh, we've reached out to the university, they've given us fundamental understanding. And then with what Frank's bringing forth, uh, I'm able to walk out of here understanding not only is beef our biggest challenge, but it's also our biggest opportunity. Um, you know, many of the other things that we're dealing with that we buy that we're pledging to reduce uh, environmental impact, uh, I get, I, you know, it's, it's surprising wonderfully that beef could actually be a positive and help offset the balance, uh, some of the balance that we're dealing with on the rest of our business. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Woodall. What I hope you take away is that there's no need to be afraid of the S word, sustainability. This is an opportunity for us as an industry. Uh, what I've seen over the years is typically when you talk to a bunch of producers on sustainability, you have one of three reactions. You have those who get mad because they do think that it's about more rules, regulations, and bureaucratic red tape. 
You have those whose eyes gloss over and they go back to their phone because they go, oh, here we go, we're talking about sustainability again. And then you have those that do see it as opportunity and say, yeah, this is, this is something we need to pay attention to. I hope I can put all of you in that final camp because it is an opportunity for us. And we have to capitalize on it because if we don't, then we will be up against rules and regulations that are gonna be placed upon us. This is our chance and everything seems to be coming together. The great work that Dr. Mintloner has done, the fact that we have GWP star now, the fact that NCBA has put out these goals all combined with the new administration who's very focused on this, this is our opportunity to be there. And I will tell you that in CBA, as I've already mentioned, we are at the table, not at the, at at the table being talked to. We are at the table in Washington, D.C. doing the talking. And that is why we are still very much alive in this discussion. And when we explain all that you have heard today, we have the EPA, USDA, the Department of the Interior, that you see the light bulbs go off. And they realize that, okay, these are partners that we can work with. And that's our goal is to continue to do that. So again, leave here today seeing this as an opportunity to showcase our story, to tell our story, and that's about stewardship of our animals, the air, the land, the soil, and the water. Thank you. Dr. Erickson, your takeaway. My, my takeaways would be that uh, we have to understand actually missions from diverse beef production. Um, and I believe work on mitigation strategies specifically for methane. What I hope is that we will have the time afforded to the industry and to the scientists to get that right. And so diet choices and, and things need to, uh, need to wait for that to be worked out. What has, the last takeaway I'd have, and it's not been mentioned a lot here, but I would remind everybody is globally, the US beef production system is the most efficient in the world. As a result of much of the production focus and efficiency, uh, we raise more beef on a smaller footprint than anywhere else. So actually I worry some, because this is a global issue, uh, more about some global production concerns. Mm -hmm. I have full confidence that the US will do its part um, I'm probably a little more concerned about extensive global production systems, and actually if we want to help solve this problem worldwide, that should be a focus. Great. Thank you. Uh, Jesse and Clint have microphones. Uh, if we have questions, please raise your hand. We'll try and get a microphone to you. We have lots of hands. <laughs> And when you get it, uh, please put it up close. And since we're going live, we're going to wait until we hear your voice. Hi, thank you. Uh, that was great. Uh, Larry, I have a question, like a for closer. Conagra. Knowing that um, fossil fuel is our main villain, basically, on carbon footprint, right? What is Conagra doing for packaging and uh, plastic reduction? I on, think of sustainability. My main concern as consumer would be avoiding single-use plastic. How is Conagra working towards that? For packaging of milk, for packaging of beef pro products. So what is the work on that? So um, thank you. That's a great question. We. Uh, Sustainability has been a very strong effort in our packaging uh, world for a long time. Uh, four years ago, we introduced a uh, fiber bowl for most of our frozen meals, uh, which was a, a lot of single-use plastic. Um, not only is that fiber bowl paper renewable resource, uh, but it's also for the first time compostable as well. So uh, that's been a huge breakthrough. And we continue to reduce the amount of packaging uh, that we are using. And we are more and more working towards moving away from uh, petroleum-based uh, plastics, if you will, to paper and uh, looking at a, a range of other fibers uh, as well. So not just traditional wood pulp, but also some things that would be fibers that are the res uh, uh, byproduct of other uh, food manufacturing or other industries. Um, Dr. Mintloner, 
would, would we benefit from um, a man has Manhattan project of sorts on enteric, enteric uh, methane emissions so that we bring together the, the best scientists working on this around the country and kind of coordinate efforts and come up with a plan to really figure this out? Well, in my opinion, but I'm totally biased there, in my opinion, yes. <laughs> Uh, I think that uh, we do need to find out what are the best working tools to help our farmers uh, furthest reduce methane and other greenhouse gases along with other pollutants too, okay? It's not all about greenhouse gases, by the way. There are water impacts and others. <clears throat> I do believe that that's needed and I'm happy that uh, maybe it was a year ago I was asked to give a similar presentation at the United Nations FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. They said if this were true, then that would be a breakthrough. So what the FAO did was they assembled a task force of 60 of the world's most renowned scientists on methane, and they had these 60 scientists come together and, and work on methane, quantification, the matrix issue I talked about, GWP star, as well as mitigation. And that report will come out next month. I serve on that, on that task force, and I can tell you the FAO is the world's number one body on food and agriculture, is taking this very seriously, and in the future, these kind of decisions will be based on facts and no longer fiction. So, but a Manhattan Project is still needed on helping us find the best ways to continue mitigation. Frank, may I make a comment? Yes, you may. A comment just to add, and Frank can respond to this, is that there have been numerous things that have been shown, especially in smaller scale experiments, that are actually quite effective. Mm -hmm. Those are not approved for the use in beef production today. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I'm not complaining or, or making a judgment on that, other than to say it is difficult, even if some compounds are found to work, to automatically get them to use and adoption in the beef industry because of FDA approval and requirements to, to decrease methane. There may be natural products, and, and uh, Frank has worked on those, on those as well, but just to be clear, if, let's say there was a drug that you could give to the cattle or a vaccine which has been in, in the pipeline, those aren't just automatically for use tomorrow. It's actually quite a process and quite difficult to get products approved for use in live animals. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a value judgment, maybe not, but it, it should be, if it has such big impact, we need to focus on getting those approved and used quickly. Jesse, do we have a question over there? Okay, please hold the microphone close. Yeah. So I have a similar question. So what are some of the techniques or new technologies that uh, you genuine panelists that are aware of that may be, be using, may be underutilized to improve the environmental footprint of beef. And then for you, Madam Moderator, uh, as a beef producer, what are some of the uh, incentives or um, if it comes to this, which I hope it doesn't, regulations that might need to be in place for those to be adopted? incentives uh, on the cow-calf side so that we didn't have to change up perhaps our um, our whole system we have a way to move our cattle around uh, through rotation grazing system we want to still be able to utilize that land efficiently optimally maintain the health of our cattle, maintain the health of our soil. Um, and I guess, yeah, staying away from additional regulations, but it's, and I guess I have the, the manager of our ranch here too. Uh, it's changing up uh, a routine that we know has worked and it's flexible, we have to uh, each day we have to deal with unknowns, uh, be it the weather, the market, um, who, if someone has to take time off for uh, personal reasons. So I guess something that can come in gradually that we can ad adapt to would be something uh, we deal with probably unknowns, 
what, two, three times a day, George? Is that a typical day at the you, ranch? If you get to noon and you haven't got to plan AZ yet, you've done pretty well. If we, if we can get to noon without going to plan AZ, he says that's a good day. Did I answer that? Yeah. Okay. So in my opinion, there is no uh, chance for any technology being implemented without financial incentives. We have to have markets in order to drive emission reductions. So there has to be some kind of credit system for you as a producer to use a certain technology which will cost you money to being, to being paid for it. Because if the consumer is not willing to pay for it and if there's no money for you to be made, then you are not likely to implement it. Okay? So in California, I can see it right now, we have a really strong market and producers are financially incentivized to do it. I would say we have a new gold rush happening right now where people are rushing into deploying technologies to reduce methane because it makes ecological sense and economical sense. If the one comes without the other, it will not work. So really quickly, what are the technologies? Some feed additives are rumen inhibitors. They, they disrupt the enzymatic production of methane. Others are uh, microbial uh, modifiers. They change the microbial uh, uh, composition of the rumen. Uh, and those, you know, there are several drugs now available, not commercially available, but for us as scientists, that reduce enteric methane anywhere between 10 to 50 percent. One of them is not a natural one and needs to undergo uh, FDA approval, and they have been they have not started that process in the United States, uh, but uh, they are likely to do it. Um, we have to look into these, all these additives, not just with respect to what they do to reducing enteric emissions, but we also need to make sure there are no unintended consequences, effects on palatability, effects on toxicology, effects, you know, what's the availability of these things? For example, we know that this Australian seaweed reduces methane by a lot, but I cannot get my hands on, on 100 kilograms of that stuff. Even if I were to put $100,000 on the table, I cannot get it because it's very difficult to produce it. So all of that plays a role. But the number one answer to your question is markets, markets, markets. We have to have an incentive for producers to do it, otherwise it won't happen. And I would agree with everything that Dr. Milloner just said, but I would say there's another layer of that, and that is the fight to protect the technologies we already have and that we're already utilizing because our production technologies are constantly under attack from activist groups, from the FDA, from USDA, from EPA, from international organizations. And so we are always working just to maintain what we already have and we're utilizing, and plant hormones being a big part of that. And we're trying to capitalize on an opportunity we have right now with the trade deal with the United Kingdom. Now that we have a post-Brexit United Kingdom, we are hoping that they will see the science, that they will see how production technologies help with the efficiency of the animal, help with this issue of sustainability in order to get them to accept it. Because it's not enough just for our Food and Drug Administration to understand this. We need other countries to understand this too, because it could make a world of difference in not only uh, our production here in the United States, but cattle production around the world. Jesse, I know I have one more question up here. Do we have time? How many more questions can we take? All right, you have the microphone. You have a question then? Uh, I think this would be uh, mostly for Frank or Galen, but I don't really understand the carbon cycle with cattle. Um, the cattle herd mitigates its methane emissions by photosynthesis with the food grown to produce the beef, correct? And, and if that is the case, then why does an adding to the cattle herd have also have that same balancing effect because you raise feed for it also. So there are two aspects of, um, that I need to explain on this biogenic carbon cycle. The one is a constant cattle herd will not add new additional carbon to the atmosphere. A constant cattle herd will not add new additional carbon to the atmosphere. It goes from atmospheric CO2 through plants, animals, and then becomes atmospheric CO2 the same amount or similar amount. But the methane picture of that biogenic carbon cycle 
uh, has a balance because the amount of methane produced and the amount of methane destroyed are in balance. A constant cattle herd will have methane produced and destroyed at similar rates. At similar rates. Overall, that's a wash. That's not enough. That's not me saying, now we can relax and it's all fine and dandy because we can still do more. If we reduce methane, we have a real good impact on further reducing warming and offsetting gases such as nitrous oxide and CO2. So this whole issue is pretty complex, but very encouraging to me because we have totally reset the stage on, on giving a narrative that's factual, that's based on science, that shows where carbon comes from, where it's going, what role livestock plays, and how important it is in uh, affecting our climate. And last not least, how we can become part of a solution. If you'll please join me in thanking the guests up here. <laughs>